good afternoon or good evening. I'm actually delighted to be with you today. It's a pleasure. It's also an honor for me to be here and to have this uh, opportunity of a conversation around an issue which is of strong interest for all of us. I would like uh, to start this conversation uh, with a small and very brief uh, movie. Sometimes uh, pictures tell more than words, uh, but I would like, however, to add some words. A month ago, the people of United Kingdom, surrounded by millions or probably billions of people around the globe, said goodbye to Queen Elizabeth II. Surprisingly, I believe this event has a lot in common with the way we face our finitude. Whoever we are, known or unknown, rich or poor, powerful or vulnerable, we have in common the need to leave this world. And thus, we also have in common the responsibility to accompany sometimes during months or even years those of us who are suffering from what we call life-limiting illnesses because human dignity is closely linked to human vulnerability. This is the place where we should stay together. This ethical responsibility is strongly established in the resolution adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2014 to strengthen palliative care around the globe. This responsibility starts early with the diagnostic of severe diseases and health-related suffering. It continues until the grief and bereavement of the families, an important issue, which was uh, actually the theme of the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day we celebrated a couple of days ago. I would like um, to share with you today 
how this ethical responsibility has been driving our efforts at WHO over the past years and how it should continue to enlighten future commitment with our 194 member states. Abandonment of patients in need of palliative care violates directly the principle of beneficence and non-maleficence. And actually, it was identified as an act of torture. So health professionals have this duty to care for patients until the end of their life. But to do so, national policies must be in place to allow the provision of good palliative care across age and disease groups where and when needed. Unfortunately, we all know this is not the case and the great majority of the people around the globe don't have access to palliative care when they need it. So this is what the resolution adopted by the World Health Assembly is focusing on, recognizing the relevance of palliative care, the need to provide it in an effective way, in a person-centered approach. There is also an emphasis on the fact we need evidence to provide good palliative care, so we need more research and knowledge sharing. Of course, the issue of equitable access is key, and I will come back to this in a moment. And finally, there is also an emphasis on the primary healthcare approach to make sure palliative care is actually integrated at all levels of care and not only in some specialized institution. Something which has also been emphasized in the Declaration of Astana adopted in 2018. So the commitment of the World Health Organization is to bring evidence to policy and practice, building strong bridges between the scientific community, the civil society, and national health authorities with key global uh, partners. We need indeed to include communities and professionals working in the field in these uh, partnerships. And this is absolutely key to build what I like to call the house of palliative care a house which is appropriate to specific cultural settings and adapted to diverse context. I do believe palliative care is an example, maybe the best example of people-centered health services following Cicely Saunders' intuition regarding the whole person approach. In addition to this ethical duty, we also need to acknowledge an important aspect, which is related to economics of palliative care. Of course, the burden of serious health-related suffering is not addressed, and we need to do it in an efficient way. The Lancet Commission has demonstrated and illustrated very well the need to provide equity, for example, in access to opioids. However, in addition to this, we also have to recognize that a PhD approach of palliative care can save cost for health services, health facilities, and of course, the patients. This is something we are currently working on with a group of experts. I think it's an important uh, issue to be um, also um, discussed with uh, policy makers. Just a quick overview of uh, what WHO has been uh, providing in terms of tools over the, the past years to facilitate the implementation of palliative care services in countries. There is a series of guides, very practical guides to uh, plan and implement palliative care. Um, some of them are focusing on specific aspects such as pediatric palliative care. Um, of course, um, the integration of palliative care with primary health care. 
and another important document on providing palliative care in the context of humanitarian crisis, a document which has been uh, actually the basis for some of the recommendations WHO provided um, to take um, care of patients with COVID during the recent crisis. We also have clinical guidelines uh, to uh, help in the management of cancer pain, for example, in adults and adolescents. More recently, guidelines on the management of chronic pain in children. And currently under development, I think to be published soon, guidelines on uh, balanced policies for access and safe use of controlled medicines. I want to uh, emphasize a tool which uh, has been produced um, thanks to the collaboration we have with our collaborating centers, uh, such as the King's College uh, and, and other centers um, in different countries, also with experts and people working in, in the field. Um, we developed uh, last year a technical report to help countries in assessing the quality of palliative care, measuring progress and uh, also uh, identifying gaps to be addressed. This is actually a good example of the collaboration which is needed, bringing expertise and experience together with uh, the um, decision at country level. So this document is uh, actually exploring the different um, components, the different blocks uh, to build the house of palliative care um, and proposing a set of indicators to empower communities, to foster and to make sure research is ongoing in, in countries, to make sure also the pillars of the house uh, which are education and training on one hand, use of essential uh, medicines in the same way on the other hand are in place. Of course, the issue, um, fundamental issue of having clear health policies in place. Under the what could be the roof of um, the house, which is integration of palliative care at all levels of care. We are currently um, working uh, with our regional offices to implement this set of indicators. There is always a phase of piloting to make sure these kind of tools is used uh, by countries adapted to their needs. And uh, this is the way for us to strengthen the capacity locally. So uh, the monitoring of the quality of palliative care can happen in countries. Jointly with this uh, technical report, we also published a brief, a technical brief, to focus on the linkage between quality and palliative care, how to articulate both with some key messages to policymakers insisting on the fact that uh, palliative care should be included in action plans and strategies for universal health coverage through this uh, primary health care approach, insisting also on the fact that providing good palliative care is contributing to the public trust in health system and avoiding, as mentioned earlier, unnecessary costs for health system. There is key messages um, on uh, the, uh, the need to train people, even if they are not palliative care specialists, to provide uh, palliative care, for example, at primary care level, and of course, to constantly assess and monitor what we are doing in the field. I would like to also uh, add an element of context. All this work on palliative care requires a specific context, and this is the context of compassionate communities. Our ethical responsibility 
to leave no one behind, as we used to say at WHO, requires this context. Building together the palliative care house means that we engage the people from an early stage of decision making. Of course, for individual decisions, but also for collective decisions. And this is also a way to learn from the field. I'm thinking about um, a, a few action briefs we recently published, trying to bring together very concrete experiences, in particular from low and middle income countries during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, experiences to maintain palliative care in very challenging environment ensuring first access to food during uh, lockdown and of course access to essential medicines during this period. I think we can learn a lot from these very creative initiatives and this is also a way to share knowledge. Finally, I think uh, this um, environment is also the best way to work on grief and bereavement in the communities. Future challenges? Well, of course, we need to continue to continue to foster our partnerships. And this conversation is an opportunity to thank again uh, many of you who have been working with us over years at global level, at country level, we need to continue to share information and develop new uh, knowledge, making sure we have the evidence of um, the, the efficiency of what we do. We need to better use new technologies. I think this is um, a challenge and an opportunity to make sure palliative care is close from where people uh, need it. We need to definitely measure what we do and uh, we probably need to work better with all sectors, including uh, beyond the health sectors. Something um, which would be important in this cultural change is also to involve better youth and probably start talking uh, about palliative care at school or uh, university. I don't want to conclude uh, this presentation, but just to uh, leave the last words to Cecily Saunders, actually how people die remains in the memory of those who live on. This is our shared responsibility. Thank you very much. <laughs>